When we first started the monastery, and John Sweat said something that really captured my attention, he says, we're not here to get anyone else. We're here to get ourselves. If other people like the way we're practicing, they're welcome to come. But if they want us to practice some other way, they can go someplace else. His was an attitude that Ajahn Furing shared. In fact, this is common throughout all the really great Ajahns. That you take the Dharma and the Vinaya as your guide. And you don't let people's opinions pull you away from that. This relates to a couple of themes that Ajahn Swat said that Ajahn Mun would talk about quite a lot. One was the theme of the customs of the Noble Ones. And John Munn, as he was practicing up in the forest, was criticized many times. We tend to think of the forest tradition as being very, very Thai. But he was attacked for not doing things the Thai way, not doing things the Lao way. The way he wore his robes, the way he ate, the way he stuck by the ascetic practices was very different from what was common back in those days, and he got a lot of flack. And his response always was, if you want to attain the noble attainments, you have to follow the customs of the noble ones, not the customs of the Thais, not the customs of the Laos, or any customs of the world aside from those of the noble ones, because everybody else's customs are the customs of people with defilement. And you follow their customs, you're not going to get out. The customs of noble ones are de designed to get you out. This is a reference to two passages in the tradition. One is in the canon, the other is in the commentary. And the commentary refers to a story where the Buddha comes back home for the first time after his awakening. And the very first morning he goes out for alms. And his father is upset. No one in the Sakyan family had ever gone out for alms like that. He thought it was disgraceful. So he told his son to stop. And the Buddha's response was that he didn't belong to the Sakyan tradition anymore. He tr belonged to the traditions of the noble ones. And one of the traditions is they go for alms. There's nothing disgraceful about it. It's a way of developing a sense of detachment toward your food, a willingness to eat whatever you can. So it helps scrub away some of the defilements of the mind. The other reference is in the canon. That's where the Buddha talks about four traditions of the Noble Ones. We chant it every now and then. The first three have to do with contentment. You're content with any old robe cloth at all, any old food, shelter, whatever you get, you're content with it. But at the same time, you don't exalt yourself for the fact that you are content. You see that sometimes. You use these requisites, realizing that there are some dangers in the attitudes that you can develop around them. So you're alert to the dangers and you do what you can to Put them aside, and you don't exalt yourself as being better than other people in that area. The fourth, you might think, would have to do with the fourth requisite, which is medicine, but it doesn't. It has to do with taking delight in developing and delight in abandoning. And this re relates to the Buddhist statement that discontent with skillful qualities was the secret to his awakening. In other words, contentment was not a blanket thing that you just put up with whatever comes, comes by outside and inside. Things outside, you learn how to adapt. If it's good enough to practice, it's good enough. But things inside, though, anything unskillful comes up in the mind, you have to delight in abandoning it. As for skillful things that are not there, you delight in trying to give rise to them and developing them even further.
This is not usually where we take our delight. We tend to delight in our unskillful qualities. They've been our companions, as the Buddha said, for a long, long time. But you've got to realize they're untrustworthy friends. They're not really friends. They're the type that try to get you to break the law, and then when you do, they go running off, and you're the one left with the punishment. So if you see there's something unskillful in the mind, you don't just sit there with it. You may have to sit for a while to watch it, but the purpose of watching is so you understand what's causing it, where it's coming from, why you go for it, what its allure is. And when you really see the allure, and then you can see the comparison with the drawbacks. You see it's not worth it. That's when you let it go. So those are the customs of the noble ones. The other principle that Ajahn Mahan liked to teach about was practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma. In other words, you don't practice it in line with, again, with the customs of your day and age. You don't practice it in line with your defilements. You practice for the sake of giving rise to disenchantment. Years back I did a book on Buddhist Romanticism, and the purpose of the book was to look at the Western tradition from the point of view of the Buddhist tradition. And one of the strange criticisms I got was that, well, why can't we have a book that criticizes Buddhism from the point of view of the West? Well, we have all too much of that. You open things up. Books, newspapers, magazines, something to do with Buddhism, and it's all about how things have to adapt. And they go back and they look at the tradition of adaptation throughout the centuries and say, see, isn't this a good thing? And they've never really made a case that it really was a good thing. We have to remember that the Buddha was the best authority on awakening the best authority in how it could be found. And it behooves us to take our ideas about awakening and take our ideas about how it can be found, and not use them as a standard, and try to use his as a standard and see if ours measure up, and see if we can develop some disenchantment with our old ideas, the things we hold on to. That's when we know that we're practicing the Dharma in accordance with the Dharma, where some of our cherished ideas can get called into question. And we can raise ourselves up to the level where we're worthy of the Dharma. People in the West tend to regard it as a commodity. And as with any commodity, it's the it's the customer who's the final judge. But what if it were the other way around? The Buddha is offering something for free. It's not a commodity. And the question is, are we up to it? If you can hold the Dharma as your as your guide, as your standard of measurement. and do what you can to lift yourself to that. That's when you get the most use out of practicing, and that's what it means to get yourself. Because when you're trying to get other people, there's always the question, well, why do you want other people? What do you want out of them? But when you're trying to get yourself, you look at the fact that you're suffering, and someplace in there in the mind is that desire to stop suffering. And when you're honest with yourself, you realize that the really heavy suffering is the stuff that you place on yourself, impose on yourself. So the work has to be done right here. You have to get yourself. 
In other words, pin down where it is that you are lying to yourself or deceiving yourself or letting yourself down. And get the mind trained to a point where it's not letting itself down anymore. That was John Swat's intention in setting up this monastery to begin with. We try to maintain it. And it's something we maintain every day as best we can. Because he doesn't have to gain anything from us. This was a pure gift. It was late in his life. He was already 70 when we were starting the place. Now he was able to get himself as we built the monastery. But in so doing, he left a lot for us. So it's not selfish to, as he would say, to get yourself. If you really do, there's a lot of good that you can leave behind. For other people who want to get themselves in the same way. <laughs>